Cristian Dan Preda. Da, mulțumesc, domnule președinte. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Over the last few weeks, Iceland has been hitting the headlines in the newspapers. The next speaker is Mr. I'm Mr. Casulida has the floor. And I'm here. Yeah, 36. You have very rightly today spoken about the death penalty, and you expressed your abhorrence to the fact. Colleagues, panie i panowie, colleagues, dear, if you want to leave our our hall, please do it as quick as possible, and stop discussion in our hall. We are starting with one minute speeches. Madam, Madam, please. Madam, please. Because you know, we cannot go ahead with our discussion. Colleagues, standing here. Colleagues, please. It's not Colleagues, please, it's not place for discussion now. You can attend one-minute speeches if you wish. Sorry, President, excuse me. Uh, Mr. Prever is actually here. He's at the back. He didn't hear you the first time. Sorry. Well, please start then. He referred to the death penalty earlier on. And we often talk here about the number of death penalties taking place in China, in Iran, etc. I would like to refer to the case of a man in Ohio, United States, who after serving 30 years in prison, he served also the death penalty because he had to follow the due process. By serving two of the major sentences according to European standards is still a very cruel treatment. And I think in our dialogue with the United States, our major ally, this issue of death sentence should come up. Let's see also the other case of somebody who has served 35 years in prison and then he was proven innocent. In death penalty, there is no deterrence, there is no correction, there is no coming back. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Thank you very much, sir, for this remark. Mr. Dan Preda. Jedna minuta. One minute. Domnule președinte, în ultimele săptămâni, Islanda a ocupat primele pagini ale pre... Thank you very much. Uh, over the last few weeks, Iceland's been in the headlines because at the beginning of this year, the Icelandic president uh, exerted her right to veto with regard to the... Uh, legislation on ice aid and this was then uh, something that uh, was deplored by the Dutch and British governments. I think that this dispute is strictly a bilateral one and should not influence in any way the accession process of, of Iceland to the EU. The European Commission should formulate its position with regard to the implications of the adoption or rejection of this legislation on on compliance with the Copenhagen criteria. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for keeping to your time. Mrs. Agnes Hankis. Madam, yes, please. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Mr. President, dear colleagues. Let us not allow fear to guide us, we often say. Some people question whether our airport security measures are too tight, while the Detroit terror attempt for us to realize that our security systems are not excessively tight, but rather still unsatisfactory. As you all know, the Slovakian Secret Service placed a plastic explosive into the bag of a Slovakian citizen. The passenger, as well as the bag, got on board without any problems and landed in Ireland. No doubt the test was spectacular, but certainly did not strengthen the belief of citizens 
that their security on one hand and right to privacy on the other hand are taken seriously by authorities. Citizens are flooded with conflicting information and misinterpretations in the press on a daily basis. After Detroit, to give you an example, the spotlight is on body scanners as the best solution. At the same time... Thank you very much, uh, Madam. Thank you very much for taking the floor. Now, Mrs. Kathleen solin Even. Strategia Lisabona prevede ca în 2010 The Lisbon Treaty says that in 2010 we in Europe should be achieving or should have achieved a knowledge economy and thus be the most competitive economy in the world and we're a long way off achieving that because we're going through the uh, most serious crisis since 1933 so these objectives have not been uh, achieved but nevertheless, they should be at the top of the EU agenda. The Spanish presidency and the Mr. Zapatero has reassured us that we will continue to pursue these objectives and the target year is now 2020. Well, I think it's uh, unacceptable for us to have to wait 10 years to achieve these results planned for 2010. Uh, we need to put in extra effort in education and research. No society can uh, develop without education and research. I think the development of our education uh, system should be a number one European priority. And I reject this visionless policy, which uh, seems to be, have been adopted in the EU as regards the education budget. This is harming our society today and creating long-term problems. And I would also uh, like to say that I'll be making uh, a written submission which members will be able to sign next week. Guillaume. Thank you very much, Madame Sylvia Guillaume. Monsieur le Président, uh, cher President, I'd like to come back to body scanners in uh, airports, which is, we're being told, is the solution to overcome serious problems that we're facing in our airports. Some states uh, are using these without even looking into the public health aspects and certainly the fundamental liberty aspects of this. 100% security doesn't exist. Let's be realistic about that. There's always human error that is, may creep in. Moreover, the examples of the uh, attack on the Amsterdam-Detroit flight shows that there's a problem of uh, information. Really, that's where we should be looking for solutions before we move on to an exchange uh, in the different stakeholder authorities. Uh, you can't just have the airports involved. Uh, there, are, there are possibilities for people to attack other aspects of transport in the underground, for example, and many who would uh, like to benefit from that opportunity. So I think we should have a broad-ranging and transparent debate, uh, which is objective, to come to a, a solution. Thank you very much. Mr. Rosario Crocetta. Pan Rosario Crocetta. Mr. Rosario Crocetta. Um, pan Gianni Vatimo. Mr. Gianni Vatimo. Thank you very much, President. Well, as an MP from the north west of Italy, I'd like to indicate to the Commission and Council uh, something about the treaties uh, which are supposed to be democratic and which are being infringed by the Italians and by local authorities in Piemonte with regard to the Lyon Turin railway line. The financing from Europe of this railway line was conditional on the uh, sharing of the project by the local population and it was conditional on the existence of uh, private investment coming from Italy. And those two conditions have not been fulfilled because on the one hand the private uh, investment from Italy hasn't occurred and the local authorities on the other hand have been stymied by a government uh, treaty, a uh, government uh, decree which says that uh, the only people who can discuss this project are the ones who approve of it. So uh, because the two conditions don't exist and there hasn't been this local cons consultation, then uh, this has been a kind of defrauding of Europe. Thank you very much, Mrs. Sandrine Bedieu. Pani Sandrine Berrier. Okay. 
what happened. She was not in her class. <laughs> okay. Excuse me. Sorry, President. Uh, this is uh, my first time. I was just trying to get things right. I'm sorry. President, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to uh, draw your attention at the beginning of the year uh, to the fact that this is the United Nations Year of Biodiversity. And we have a European strategy here, 2004 to 2010, which is meant to be a campaign against the loss of biodiversity. 40% of our natural heritage is under threat. Now, as biodiversity is a litmus test for the health of the planet, it, it, it reflects also our, our degree of development. Now, the crisis is accelerating. And for now in the future, I hope that the European Union and the European Parliament will be able to meet the challenges uh, that we face and will be able to take on, uh, adopt all the appropriate measures and ambitions for us to achieve our targets here, which we should have achieved by 2010. 2010 should be a year of great promise, and I hope that we can now do better than we did in Copenhagen. Thank you very much. Congratulations, Madam, for your first speech in the European Parliament. Thank you. Pan Soren Bo Sondergaard. Mr. Sondergaard. Thank you very much, President. Since uh, Turkey has banned the DTP, they have uh, seen arrests of many uh, people who are previous mayors and publicly elected individuals. I have been there myself. Uh, during the new year to take part in a legal case uh, and even though um, the, the parliamentary immunity hadn't been lifted they were nevertheless arrested there was a, uh, a mayor who was prevented from leaving um, his country which meant he couldn't take place in this parliament's uh, conference on Kurdish rights on the 2nd and 3rd of February in this very parliament I'd like to call on the president and I hope that the President is actually listening to what I'm saying. I would call on the President to lodge a protest with the Turkish authorities and demand that the democratically elected mayors should uh, be given the opportunity to visit the European Parliament next week. Thank you very much for your speech. I would like uh, to send me a note on this subject. Please send a note to my mailbox with all the details. Thank you. Next speaker is Paul Newtel. Freedom and democracy is now here. Okay. Um, uh, Pan Barry Madlener. Then the floor goes to Barry Madlener. Thank you very much, President. Members of Parliament, freedom of expression in the Netherlands is under pressure at the moment. Ger Wilders, our party leader, will have to appear before the court in the Netherlands next week, not because he's committed an offence, but because of his political opinions. The Freedom Party would like to warn of the dangers of Islamification. Islam is not a religion, but it's a philosophy that's trying to overtake us. Uh, it doesn't stop at Western freedoms in Western Europe. So political opinion makers are now being threatened by fundamentalists, and people who express criticism of Islam in uh, the Netherlands are now being threatened by the, uh, the Department of Public Prosecutions and may mean that they end up in prisons, and that is a threat for our democracy. We mustn't let this happen. And we are sounding the alarm here for the Netherlands and the rest of Europe. Stop Islamification. Stop uh, politicians from expressing their opinion freely. We should uh, have the right to uh, demonstrate for our freedom, protest for our freedom. Kurt Builders is now uh, being put in a situation which is unacceptable. Thank you. Mr. Marian Marinescu has the floor now. Mulțumesc, domnule președinte. Apreciez faptul. Thank you, President. I'm very pleased that the Spanish Presidency is adopting projects which are going to transform Europe uh, through innovation and legitimation. I do feel, however, that this Presidency's programme uh, should deal 
uh, to a greater extent with internal waterways and the Rhine Mine Danube Canal. In fact, this doesn't deal with these issues at all because we need a strategy for Europe's inland waterways, a much better strategy than we have. Now, I know the Spanish presidency faces a great number of challenges, such as the implementation of the Lisbon uh, Treaty, managing the crisis and achieving sustainable development. But if we're talking about sustainable development, I do believe that our transport infrastructure and our inland waterways are essential if we're going to achieve this sustainable development and make a contribution to creating more jobs. I find that there's a major lacuna in the Spanish Presidency's programme and it should be remedied. Patrao Neves. Maria Docho Patrao Neves has the floor. Thank you, President, ladies and gentlemen. The member states have just suffered, many member states have just suffered a great deal of very bad weather, especially in the month of December. Portugal is one of those countries. Uh, on the 23rd of December, we suffered enormous rainfall and enormous damage from that rainfall and accompanying storm. Uh, uh, all areas of the country were affected, the Algarve in the south and the north of the country, and millions of euros of infrastructure were lost. And also farmers were badly harmed and will uh, be unable to... Uh, produce some of their crops this year and that includes greenhouse crops and uh, for the time being they have no prospect of immediate assistance for recovery. So I'd like to point out that these natural disasters are increasing in frequency in Europe because of the ch climate change and this means that we need support for what people are losing because of these uh, climatic disasters and for this we need leadership from the European Union which is imperative and urgent we need a system Artur Zasada the floor goes to Artur Zasada now not here apparently Pan, uh, Mr. Mario Pirillo Not here either. Patrice Tirolion then. Pan Ricardo Cortes. Ricardo Cortes Lastra. Presidente. President, first of all, I'd like to express my condolences and my solidarity to the uh, victims of the earthquake in. Haiti. This uh, earthquake is the one which has, has the most, done the most damage in living memory. Uh, it has already, it has done tremendous harm to a population which is always already living in poverty. Suffering has for a long time been part of every day of the Haiti population and now the situation is even worse. Therefore, we have a severe humanitarian situation uh, and the people that need our uh, aid and we have to make a contribution also to the future sustainable development. Thank you very much. Corina Cretu is the next speaker. Three years on from accession to the European Union, the Romanians and the Bulgarians are still not in uh, haven't been given the f full welter of rights that they should have, um, free movement of workers. There are some member states that still have in place barriers and obstacles to this. An extension of the restrictions con con concerning access to the labour market is happening despite the recommendations from the European Commission where we've heard that the free movement actually promotes economic growth. The economic crisis is being used as a pretext to maintain these restrictions and we could maybe talk of pressure that is being exerted on migrant workers. And uh, we can imagine that the flows of uh, workers from the new countries uh, are being somewhat exaggerated, but w all the potential of uh, these migrants is not being fully exploited. The European Commission ought to take measures to do something about this protectionism that has been put in place and that is harming growth. Madam Izaskun Bilbao Baranitsa. 
present, ladies and gentlemen. When the television stations uh, transmit pictures of people being arrested, um, uh, what happens to people when they're arrested and they have their property blocked, their bank accounts blocked, and they're in jail for over a year without a trial? This is happening in the Basque country, and people are being undressed, uh, arrested in this way without notice. Many of them, we fear, are, uh, have been tortured. There are cases which have been on the books for over seven years now, and we still don't have clear court rulings. Uh, we're still waiting then for judgments on these cases of people who have been arbitrarily, uh, arbitrarily arrested back in 2003. I'm referring to two journalists who, whose cases have still not been resolved. We're waiting for a judgment in the next couple of weeks, but it is, far, it is high time and far overdue. Regret Auken. Madam Auken has the floor now. Well, colleagues, a year ago the Parliament adopted my report on the follow-up of uh, building policy in Spain. This was adopted by a very broad majority and we expressed our concerns, particularly about the fact that a lot of European uh, legislation had been breached. Now, the situation in Spain uh, was very much fraught with corruption and abuse on the part of mm, construction companies and entrepreneurs. People are wondering how come their buildings can be destroyed and they're not even being compensated. We haven't received any answer yet from the Spanish government about all the criticism raised in the report. So I ask you, President, officially to ask the Spanish government to inform the European Parliament about its position with regard to the conclusions of that report. Uh, is the next speaker. Thank you very much, President. I wanted to point out to you the terrible things that are happening in Italy at the moment. There are illegal workers working in agriculture who have become victims of a previously unprecedented wave of xenophobia and attacks. 1,500 immigrants have been uh, chased out of their homes and have been abused. Uh, briefly, it was the case that illegal immigrants were arrested, but that has now led to the fact that they are now being exploited and it is impossible for them to have access to basic services. So I call on the Commission and the Council to look into a possibility whether the UN Convention uh, on Rights of All of Workers could be uh, enshrined in European Union law so we avoid these sort of things in the future. To, to send me Please send to, to my email address a brief information about in your future. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Pan Wojciechowski. Uh, Mr. Wojciechowski is the next speaker. Thank you very much, Chairman. A few weeks ago, the European Commission rejected a motion from the Polish government to provide assistance for restructuring of holdings uh, producing tobacco. This means that about 15,000 small holdings will go bankrupt. Uh, tobacco producers in the south of Poland, which is a re one of the poorest regions in the European Union. I don't know the reasons for the decision of the European Commission, but even if it's based by some formal mistakes on the part of the Polish government, then I don't think that bureaucracy and red tape should overrule the fate of uh, real people. Therefore, I would like the European Commission to, to re look at the subject once again and reconsider the motion by the Polish government, bearing in mind the fate of those poor farmers. Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much. Rui Tavares is the next speaker. Thank you. Well, the previous situation has, uh, the previous speaker just de described the situation in Calabria, 
in southern Italy and the expulsion of foreign workers. This is a serious problem because if you have uh, black workers, immigrants, uh, living and working separately and dealt with separately uh, by the police, this th sort, of, uh, sort of thing is going to happen following the initial shootings of these immigrant workers in Rosano. Now, these people have been expelled from the region. They're waiting to be expelled from the country, whereas the uh, authorities say that they were acting simply to uh, protect the local population, whereas the people who have been expelled from the region have, in fact, been uh, uh, victims of, in fact, racial cle cleansing and violence against them, not the other way round. These people have been derived of their rights. This is an unsatisfactory situation, and they should not be uh, expelled from the country uh, without fair treatment. Thank you very much. Uh, the next speaker is John Bogdan. Thank you, Mr. President. The current focus of global politics is the future of our planet. Yet, amidst discussion about an increase in world population, the European Union have failed to ever give clear direction on concerns that surround migration. Instead, measures to promote the movement of people are promoted with the usual justifications of filling brain drains and boosting economies. According to EU figures, 1.7 million European migrants came to the UK last year, nearly double the number five years ago. Just before Christmas, Serbia applied for EU membership and Croatia could join as soon as 2012. We have yet to feel the full impact of the freedom of movement for workers enshrined in the Treaty of Rome. In the case of the ten countries which joined in the EU in 2004, among them Poland, the Czech Republic and Latvia, the door is not fully open until next year. In the case of the Bulgaria and Romania, it's 2014. Given that the living standards in both countries are very low, I only imagine that this will have a significant impact on the more developed member states. The rest of Europe may look on critically when we've dem demanded vetoes on immigration policy. The Lisbon Treaty gives the EU almost as much power over issues such as CAP gives to our agricultural policy. Dziękuję we panu. Totally pan to the Thank you very much, Mr. Chanat Segeti. Mr. President, Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, theoretically the European Union is about democracy, freedom, respect of human rights and uh, ensuring uh, the rule of law. These are the common principles of the member states. Unfortunately, this is only theoretically true because Slovakia violates fundamental principles of the European Union on a daily basis. Thereby, I propose that the European Union take appropriate measures uh, to uh, to suspend Slovakia's EU membership because of their uh, extremist, racist uh, language law. But Slovakia is not the only country in the Carpathian Basin to violate uh, these principles. There is a similar uh, political offensive against the uh, ethnic Hungarian minority in Romania. There are about 300,000 ethnic Hungarians living in uh, the territory of Romania. and. And that's why we should talk about the, their rights now. Thank you very much. Uh, Jose Manuel Fernandez is the next speaker. President, ladies and gentlemen, the uh, President of the Council on the 22nd of October 2008 said that 2010 was going to be the European Year Against Poverty and Social Exclusion. At the time, the European Union had 78 uh, million people at risk of poverty, of which 19 million were children. Today, given the effect of the economic crisis, there has been an increase uh, in unemployment and the situation is worse. We have to increase our efforts to combat poverty. Uh, human dignity should be a priority objective of our political action and we cannot accept that we have people in Europe suffering from hunger. Thus, the European Union, I say, should now assess the present situation, the social situation in Europe, and increase the financial resources available in order to implement the necessary measures in order to combat poverty. In order uh, to do this, we have to change the budget. Thun und Hohenstein. Uh, now the floor goes to Madame Tunde Hohenstein. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Chairman. 
you congratulated us on the, accept, on the adoption of the Lisbon Treaty. It's important today when Haiti needs our help so desperately, we can remember again how important it is that the Union functions well. President, we must admit that we have not seen much debate about the Lisbon Treaty in some member states. There is very little knowledge about among citizens and the accusations of, the, of those who are on the no side. It is not normally uh, refuted properly. There are uh, myths, urban myths about the treaty. Today, when the Lisbon Treaty is in force, there is a great opportunity to start an information campaign about the treaty and about the European Union throughout the Union. We must use this opportunity. Therefore, I would like to turn to those responsible for communication in the European Union to seize this opportunity, this very moment of change, to conduct a proper campaign, to make citizens aware, to build a European identity. Thank you. The floor goes to Ramon Anegui Atonde. Sí, señor presidente. Hace solo unos días. Yes, President, just a few days ago, two eight activists were arrested by the French, uh, Spanish and Portuguese police. These two people had just committed attacked, attacks with explosive in Spain. I would like to publicly uh, speak on behalf of all victims of terrorism in Spain and express our pleasure at the successful cooperation between the three police forces in Portugal, Spain and France on this occasion. This is part of Europe. This is a good thing. Don't forget in Spain uh, we've suffered more than a thousand uh, murders by ETA over the years. And there's no political justification for the terroristic actions. Our thanks to France and Portugal for cooperating with us in the fight against ETA. Thank you very much. Uh, the next speaker is Mr. Zygmantas Balcitis. The colleagues, I would like to draw your attention at the situation at the eastern border of the Baltic States. For many years before every Christmas, there is continuous blocking of the trucks coming from all Europe at the eastern external EU borders. The situation causes serious disturbances both for the carriers and for the EU companies. It even more strains the relation between the EU and boarding third countries. I believe that newly established European External Action Service would need to react to this current situation and to cooperate more actively within the third countries involved to resolve this situation. Thank you. Thank you very much for your speech. Madame Nicole Nielsen. Thank you, President, colleagues. The Gaza Strip is being strangled. It is subject to a complete blockade since 2007, and in 2009 it was victim of aggression, lethal aggression from the Israeli military who were accused of war crimes. Today it is the Egyptian authorities who have started building an underground metal wall to stop any supplies getting through the tunnels. When are we going to stop this collective punishment being inflicted on men, women and children whose suffering is being manipulated uh, like on a political chess chessboard of a different age? We have to act. The EU has every chance of doing this because they're a major trade partner of Israel and they contribute to aid to the Palestinian territories, the Israeli government will only change its ways if it is subject to pressure by the international community. The EU can play a determining role in uh, resuming the peace process and creating an independent sovereign Palestinian state uh, with the borders established in 67. Thank you very much, Mr. Jaroslav Paška. 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 Thank you very much. Yes, last year the Slovak Republic was uh, slandered repeatedly by the Hungarian members because there were laws promulgated which allegedly affected their rights. But this is a nonsense and we have turned to the High Representative of uh, National Minorities, Knut Holbeck, to give a judgment on what is happening. On the 4th of January 2010, the Commissioner for Minority 
issues. Knut Holbeck has given a basic statement uh, on this, and that says that the legislation on language rights is pursuant to the uh, is conform with the uh, Slovak constitution. It's been noted that the language rights of minorities have not been violated. Knut Wallerbeck at the same time praised the Slovak Republic. Thank you. In, the Thank you. In most member states of the European Union, um, the, there has been an earthquake, and uh, it's something which you can't see on the surface. It's the earthquake in the financial markets. There are new reports now that in Carinthia, in a bank which was bailed out by the state, EU money was also in circulation. I would ask for this to be investigated by OLAF so that we have the opportunity under the new presidency perhaps to be more independent than they were before. And I'd also like to mention an investigation of the Corporate Europe Observatory, the Captive Commission. In other words, this is this basic core problem that in experts groups who should actually be preparing to inform us and protect us of such, from such financial earthquakes, that major industry, big business is more uh, represented and small companies and unions have virtually nothing to say and the ratio is 80 to 20 and that needs to be changed. Thank you very much, Mr. Guy Mitchell. I'd like to join with colleagues who raised the issue of Haiti. I know we will be having a debate on this in this session. But there's one particular aspect of it that I want to raise now, and it is the fact that the United States is far better organized, yes, they are nearer to the, to the region, than is the European Union. Individual member states have responded very well. Uh, we see, for example, the Belgian Air Force in the vicinity. We are the biggest donor of aid in the world, and when it comes to humanitarian aid, we should be efficient in that donation. And I believe it's time, under the new Lisbon Treaty, to look at having on a rolling basis a six-month standby team, including large and small member states, that will be able to deliver humanitarian aid where it's needed on agreement between the institutions. It doesn't have to be the same a standby group for each six months. It could change with the presidency, but there should be a standby group so that we can deliver aid under a humanitarian EU flag. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you very much. Esther Grelier is the next speaker. Pan Provincias de Rosa. Provincias de Rosa is the next speaker. Mr. President, we must urgently renew our call. And when I say we, I mean the Parliament, the Council and the Commission on Israel to end the siege of Gaza. A year ago, over 1,400 people died in the war on Gaza, mostly civilians and including over 300 children. Yet Israel still prevents the rebuilding of homes, businesses, medical facilities, the provision of clean water, sanitation and electricity, while also blocking adequate food supplies. Europe must also intervene, Mr. President, immediately to prevent the expulsion of journalist Jared Mazelson, a US citizen, and insists that he should be allowed to continue his work with MAN, the non-profit news agency in the West Bank. The Commission has blocked the fisheries agreement with Guinea because government actions there resulted in the death of 150 demonstrators. Why do we treat Israel differently? It's time for Europe to tell Israel that our patience is at an end and that they must comply with international human rights law, including the right of the free press to be free from in government interference. Thank you, Chairman. In November last, the European Commission launched a public campaign on the European Union strategy, taking us up to 2020 in order to achieve the so-called Lisbon strategy, whose objectives uh, have been uh, made widely known but, uh, and were also intended to decrease poverty and increase employment. Now, up until the 15th of January last, 
it seems, uh, obviously, we're still going through the hearings for the new commission, which will only take office uh, in February next month. Having said that, we've had this important report on the achievement or non-achievement of the Lisbon strategy published on the 15th of January, and uh, we've had no official reaction from the European Commission on this under the present circumstances. Uh, I'd like to draw your attention uh, to this, uh, Chairman, because it is urgent that the European Commission, when it comes into office, reviews its position on this. Mr. Schöpflin, please. Thank you, President. Uh, the Spanish Presidency. The Spanish Presidency is in fact launching a new institution in the European Union, the Trio Presidency. There have of course been earlier trios, but this is the first to have elaborated a coordinated programme and equally the first under the Lisbon Treaty. The two other member states making up the Trio Presidency are Belgium and Hungary. Now, from the Hungarian perspective, what is particularly valuable in the new institution is the opportunity to offer our own distinctive contribution to the process. Among other questions the, the TRIO Presidency will deal with of particular concern is the growing problem of water shortage in Europe. For the first time in history, uh, in Europe's history, Europe is facing a potential water shortage. Given its strategic location, Hungary is uniquely placed to put this issue on the European agenda. Thank you very much. Uh, Last speech, uh, Pan Nick Griffin. Mr. President, two months ago my constituency was hit by disastrous floods. Deceitfully blamed on climate change, the real reason for the devastation of the town of Cockermouth was the EU-imposed privatisation theft of public services. The proper management of reservoirs has been replaced by cost-cutting negligence by United Utilities, leading to safety margins being ignored and a panic-stricken decision to open sluice gates and release a man-made deluge on the town. The fact that only one brave man died in the floods was little short of miraculous, but such disasters will increase in frequency as more and more public services are looted by greedy corporations. Finally, my constituents are shocked that they will not receive a penny from the EU Solidarity Fund because the UK cannot apply unless the damage exceeds three billion. Since Britain is not an earthquake zone, it's almost impossible to conceive of a disaster which would trigger such a payment. So British taxpayers, who contribute a disproportionate amount to the fund, have no realistic chance of benefiting from it. So much for solidarity. We want our money back. Uh, thank you very much. Well, I will give an uh, additional speech. I would like to explain to you, uh, colleagues, that I am taking also into account if anybody was speaking in one minute speeches last time or two times ago. It is also taken into, into account. But because Alde probably didn't have enough voices, 195 is Mr. Kalager. Please, last, uh, last speech. Uh, thank you, President. President, uh, Haiti is a country in desperate need. Uh, of uh, help, whether it be medicine, food, water, and, and shelter in critical levels. Many people in this area that are awaiting help after the earthquake, and it's essential that the European Union is to the fore in the international uh, arena to provide support and. Uh, help for Haiti. I strongly urge include food aid. European Commission to include food aid for the people of Haiti. I know that canned fish products, high in protein and have a strong shelf life and could be provided at short notice as it was in the past. In conclusion, Marshan Iremern Commission, your In conclusion, therefore, I ask the European Union and the Commissioners to provide development aid, especially in light of this current situation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. At this moment, hearings are about to start, so I invite you to, to attend the hearings. 
I gave the floor to 32 speakers this, this afternoon. Please remember that you must put your name on the list well in advance. I have a list here of 72 people and I chose the speakers in the order in which you submitted your names exactly in the very same order. So please try and put your name on the list the earliest possible for next month already. Thank you very much. We are now moving on to listen to him. Uh, point of order. As President, uh, it seems to be a rather subjective selection of speakers in a procedure that really should be set out very clearly. Your argument seemed to be that you chose according to the order. But you also mentioned if uh, speakers had taken the floor on previous occasions uh, according to the same procedure. If you look at your documents a little more closely, you'll note that today you didn't follow the order not only that but you did take some of the people who already spoke on the last occasion in plenary so the lines of argument that you are putting forward uh, have not been substantiated I don't think the president of parliament can censor members in this way I find this completely unacceptable let me explain sir let me explain to you that I didn't choose those who took the floor a month ago. You can check on the list yourself. Please verify yourself on the list. I didn't give the floor to those who spoke uh, last month or those who spoke two months ago. They, have, uh, they didn't have that much of a chance to be uh, select. You can come to my office. We can check it together. I'm not afraid of that check. Thank you very much. The session is now suspended. We are moving on to the rooms where hearings are now starting.